Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Gulf Keystone Petroleum Limited half year results investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged, they can be submitted at any time via the QA tab that's just situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. And these will be available via your InvestorMeet company dashboard. Uh, before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. And I would now like to hand you over to CEO John Harris. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you. Good morning and thank you for joining Gulf Keystone Petroleum's 2023 half year results. I'm John Harris and I'm GKP's uh, Chief Executive Officer. I'm joined today by Ian Weatherden, Chief Financial Officer, who will be talking you through our financial performance. I'm also joined by John Hulme, COO, Gabriel papanola Gree, Chief Commercial Officer, Alistair Robinson, Chief Legal Officer, and Aaron Clark, Head of Investor Relations and Corporate Communications. <coughs> Over the next few slides, we'll run through our operational and financial performance in the half year and year to, to date, talk about the current situation on the ground in Kurdistan and Iraq, and explore the outlook for Gulf Keystone Petroleum in the second half. Following that, we'll open the lines up for questions. Slide two, disclaimer. I'd like to remind you that the presentation slides are available to view on our website. I will leave you to review the legal disclaimer in your own time. Next slide, please. Highlights. We entered 2023 following a year of record profitability, cash generation and shareholder returns, and with strong momentum in the Shikan field, driving increases in profitable production growth. On the 25th of March, the world changed. With the closure of the Iraq-Turkey pipeline and the suspension of Kurdistan ex crude exports, our operational and financial performance were materially impacted with reduced profitability and cash flow generation in the first half of the, of the year, driven by the suspension of oil sales and continued delays to, to Kurdistan regional government's payments. In response, we moved quickly to preserve liquidity, suspending all that expansion activity, reducing the organization, and canceling the 2022 final dividend. Decis <clears throat> Decisive action has placed us in a much better position to manage the current situation. Deep cost cuts have reduced our average monthly run rate of net capex operating costs and other GNA to around $6, $6 million in the second half of the year. We have also started and increased local sales to around 23,000 barrels of oil per day towards the end of this month, selling over half a million barrels of crude to local buyers since the 19th of July. At current volumes and realized prices, we're able to cover our monthly costs and manage our accounts payable with greater flexibility. The economic and political environment on the ground remains complex and continues to evolve. However, we have seen steps in the right direction. Slide five. Please, overview of current operating environment. Crude exports from Kurdistan have been suspended for over five months following the closure of the Iraq-Turkey pipeline on the 25th of March. The pipeline was shut in by Turkey following the award to Iraq of its long-standing arbitration against Turkey at the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, which dates back to, to 2014. While no official timeline has been announced for the reopening of the pipeline, Negotiations remain active between the Kurdistan regional government, Iraq and Turkey. Recently, meetings with senior officials from all three governments have taken place in Erbil, Baghdad and Ankara, with supportive statements made regarding the need to resume exports as soon as possible. The prolonged suspension of exports has in turn put pressure on the Kur Kurdistan regional government's finances and extended delays to international oil company payments. Overdue receivables to Gulf Keystone Petroleum amount to $151 million net based on the KBT pricing mechanism, with the last oil sales payment received in March 23 for the month of September 22. The approval of the 2023 to 2025 Iraqi budget marks significant political progress in creating a framework for the exchange of Kurdistan production for budget transfers, potentially paving the way for the Kurdistan regional government to broadly cover its monthly expenditures, including ongoing international oil company receivables. However, negotiations are ongoing between Kurdistan and Iraq regarding its final implementation, as well as regarding the creation of a new Iraqi oil and gas law. As the situation continues to evolve, we have, have, to respond, we have responded in three ways, focusing on what we can control. Firstly, we have moved aggressively to preserve liquidity, 
which I will talk about on the next slide. Secondly, we have co commenced local sales with domestic demand for Shikan crude from local buyers emerging in July. While the market remains unpredictable, there are signs demand is increasing in the continued absence of export availability. Realized prices for Shikan crude to date have averaged around $30 a barrel, which in line which is in line with what we are currently seeing in local market considering different crude qualities. Payments are made in advance, eliminating payment risk. And Gulf Keystone Petroleum keeps its entitlement share currently at around 36%. Thirdly, Gulf Keystone Petroleum and other international oil companies are making our collective voice heard with the Kurdistan Regional Government and other key stakeholders through the Association of the Petroleum Industry of Kurdistan, or APICURE. Apicure was established at the beginning of this year with Gulf Keystone Petroleum as one of its founding members. The association advocates for the common interest of its members towards all stakeholders and provides a forum to share industry information and best practices. Regarding the current situation, Apicure is emphasizing the importance of restarting pipeline exports, resuming timely oil sales payments, and in general, protecting the contractual rights embedded in our production sharing agreements, which are governed by English law. We continue to encourage, we are, sorry, we continue to be encouraged by assurances from the Kurdistan regional government that production sharing contracts have sanctity in line with the Kurdistan regional government's historic track record. Next slide, please. Operational activity. Gulf Keystone Petroleum's operational activity in 2023 has shifted rapidly from a focus on driving profitable production growth with record production levels achieved in March to a focus on liquidity preservation following the suspension of exports. Following the ITP closure, production was curtailed and diverted into storage. The Shikan field shut in on the 13th of April when storage was full. We, had, we also suspended all expansion activity, including drilling, well workovers, facilities expansion, and well pad preparation, and regrettably reducing the organization, including a 55% reduction in our expat workforce and a reduction in working hours for our local work workforce. While our focus has been aggressively reducing CapEx and OpEx costs, <clears throat> excuse me, we have maintained sufficient operational capability to both quickly resume exports and to restart more labor-intensive trucking operations for local sales. On the 19th of July, we commenced local sales and from PF1, the sales starting at PF2 in August. We have sold crude from storage whilst restarting a number of PF1 and PF2 wells. To date, we have seen no degradation to well performance from the extended shut-in, but continue to ramp up production gradually to limit, to limit drawdown on the reservoir. Since we started, we have steadily increased volumes with gross average sales of around 23,000 barrels of oil per day between the 19th and 29th of August. We are focused now on increasing sales and there appears to be significant demand for Shikan crude. Nonetheless, volumes and pricing remain difficult to predict, and we continue to rain, retain significant flexibility to dial operational activity up or down. If we are unable to maintain sustainable local sales, we, will ha we have identified options to reduce monthly costs by a further $2 million. However, these could potentially delay a timely return to full production. Next slide, please. Local sales. It's excellent to be producing and selling crude um, again, and the teams at PF1 and PF1 have done a fantastic job in, challenging, in a challenging operating environment to transition smoothly and safely from pipeline operations to trucking operations, which have lasted, which will, uh, which were last implemented in 2019. We are currently loading over 120 trucks per day and looking to move to 24/7 operations when local sales increase. Throughout the period, we have maintained a rigorous focus on safety, even in the face of new operational challenges presented by trucking operations and temperatures on the ground that have approached 50 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. GKP and the Shikan field. Given the challenging operating environment at the moment in Kurdistan, it is easy to forget the prize we have in front of us once the situation stabilizes. Looking back, we have overcome several challenges to generate profitable growth from the Shikan field's substantial reserve base and significant shareholder value. Despite the current situation, there remain a number of attractive fundamentals to note about the Shikan field and our track record. First, we continue to operate a large, long-life asset 
with over 800 million barrels of gross 2P reserves and 2C resources, as confirmed by the 2022 Competent Persons Report and External Independent Audit. Second, production in low cost so production is low cost and GKP has consistently had one of the lowest operating costs and GNA per barrel amongst Kurdistan and international peers. Third, we have a strong track record of profitable production growth with over 117 million barrels produced to date and 40% production growth between 2018 and 2022. Fourth, we have demonstrated a commitment to shareholder distributions with $440 million distributed in dividends and buyback since 2019. This adds up to considerable upside potential should the operating environment improve. Now, with that, I will now hand you over, Ian, uh, over to Ian for the uh, financial review. Ian. Great. Uh, thanks very much, John, and, uh, and good day, everyone. Uh, moving to, to slide 10. Uh, building on our strong financial performance in 2022, in which we generated record profitability and cash flow, distributed $215 million of dividends to shareholders and repaid a $100 million bond. We were on track for another strong year in 2023 until the closure of the Iraq-Turkey pipeline. As John mentioned, the suspension of export and continued delays to KRG payments materially impacted our financial performance in the first half of the year, reducing profitability and cash generation. In response, we move quickly to preserve liquidity, aggressively reducing our costs with a significant step down in activity from 1Q to 2Q, which is evident in the bottom right net CapEx chart. Today, increasing local sales are enabling us to cover our estimated monthly expenditures, which I'll talk about shortly. Next slide, please. Adjusted EBITDA, which is a good measure of underlying cash flow from operations in the first half of the year decreased from just over $200 million in the first half of 2022 to $34 million, primarily reflecting the suspension of exports and lower realized prices in the first quarter. While we enjoyed record production levels in the first quarter, gross average sales in the first six months of the year almost have relative to 2022 to 23,256 barrels of oil per day, with no revenue from the 25th of March. Dated Brent prices decreased from $108 per barrel in the first half of 2022 to $80 per barrel in the first quarter of 2023. The Brent price impact was compounded by the KRG unilaterally changing the reference price for dated Brent to Kurdistan blend resulted in an increase in the discount per barrel of about $6. Combining these impacts, our realized price was down $33 per barrel from the first half of 2022 to $51 per barrel in the first quarter of 2023. Next slide, please. The impact of lower adjusted EBITDA and increasing delays to KRG payments drove a significant reduction in free cash flow from $177 million in the first half of 2022 to a cash outflow of $10 million in the first half of 2023. The closure of the pipeline towards the end of March has resulted in only two KRG payment receipts this year, with the last payment being received in March for September 2022 sales. Accounts receivable totaling $151 million net to Gulf Keystone for October 22 to March 23 oil sales are now all overdue. The resumption of pipeline exports and consistent budget transfers from Iraq to Kurdistan are likely required before we see a return to more normalized KRG payments and the KRG providing international oil companies a plan to address the outstanding arrears. Net capital expenditures were $47 million in the first half. Capitalizing on the momentum from 2022, we had a very active drilling and facilities uh, expansion program in the first quarter. With delays in the reopening of the pipeline, we quickly reduced expenditures to preserve liquidity, resulting in a two-thirds reduction in net capex from $35 million in 1Q to $12 million in 2Q. Following the payment 
of a $25 million interim dividend in March, we canceled the payment of the 2022 final dividend to preserve liquidity. We continue to believe dividends are important to reward shareholders and we'll re review reinstating the dividend when the environment and our liquidity position improve. In July, we restarted local sales, which along with cost reductions and managing accounts payable, have supported our liquidity position. Our cash balance as of yesterday was $82 million. To manage credit risk, buyers are required to prepay for all local crude purchases. Golf Keystone, as operator, has collected sales proceeds on behalf of Mole and the KRG. Prepayments for crude not yet lifted and amounts due to Mole and the KRG totaling $8 million are included in our current cash balance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Golf Keystone has consistently maintained strict control of its costs and has one of the lowest operating costs in GNA per barrel amongst Kurdistan and international peers. While costs have been increasing in the first quarter of the year, reflecting increased operational activity and investment in the Shikan field, Following the suspension of exports, we move quickly to reduce our costs to preserve liquidity. Operating costs in the first half of the year were flat relative to the prior period, reflecting increased costs in 1Q related to higher production, offset by a 36% decrease in 2Q as production was shut in and non-essential maintenance deferred. After adjusting for non-recurring corporate G&A costs of $2 million and an increase in non-cash depreciation of $1 million, other G&A expenses were flat from the first half of 2022. We continue to review our cost structure and look for further reduction opportunities. Next slide, please. Deep cost cuts have been key to preserving liquidity. Our estimated uh, aggregate net capex, operating costs, and other GNA monthly run rate is currently around $6 million for the second half of the year, which is down two thirds from the first quarter of the year. The decline in run rate reflects a steep reduction in capex guidance from initially 160 to $175 million to the current 60 to $65 million. Current guidance reflects $10 million of cost savings realized in June. We now forecast less than $15 million in net capital expenditures in the second half of the year. Assuming a continuation of gross average sales of around 23,000 barrels per day and average realized prices of around $30 a barrel, our entitlement share of 36% covers our estimated monthly run rate of around $6 million net and provides us with increased flexibility to manage the timing of payment of our accounts payable. While the demand for Shikan crude is promising and we are targeting further increases, sales volumes and prices remain unpredictable. As a result, if sustainable local sales do not materialize, we would consider taking additional liquidity actions. This includes identified options to reduce our monthly expenditures by up to $2 million. We would take this decision carefully as it could potentially impact our operating capacity and delay the time it takes to return to full production when conditions improve. While good progress has been made, we continue to pursue further cost reductions and inventory sales, and will consider further sources of liquidity as necessary. With that, I'd like to now hand it back to you, John. <clears throat> Thanks, Ian. Uh, final si slide outlook. To summarize, the suspension of exports and continued delays to the Kurdistan regional government's payments have had a material impact on our, on our performance in the first half of the year. In response, we have taken rapid and aggressive action to preserve liquidity, enabling us to reduce average monthly capex and costs to around $6 million in the second half of the year. With current local sales and prices, we are generating enough cash to cover our monthly costs and increase our flexibility to manage our accounts payable. Nonetheless, while demand for Shikan crude appears significant, the market remains unpredictable, and we would take further liquidity actions without sustainable sales 
as we remain relentlessly focused on cost reductions and preserving our liquidity. Looking at the big, bigger picture, we continue to believe the suspension of exports will be temporary and that Kurdistan regional government payments will normalize in due course. As an industry, we are continuing to engage with the Kurdistan regional government and other key stakeholders to make our voice heard with the objective of protecting the interests of our stakeholders and returning our industry to its role of generating significant economic value for Kurdistan, Iraq, and our shareholders. When conditions improve, we look forward to returning to a balance of growth and returns. <clears throat> With that, we'll now move on to look at our list of questions and, uh, and we'll try and answer those as best we can. John, Ian, that's great. And thank you very much indeed for your presentation this afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Um, Ian, John, as you can see, we have received a number of questions uh, today throughout your presentation. And thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions uh, but guys if I may just hand back to you just to read out those questions and give your responses where it's appropriate to do so and then I'll pick up from you at the end thank you yeah great thank you um, I guess the first question we can see is can you please provide more background information on the issues on the Kurdistan issues and what brought it to a head um, I think, okay, so um, I think I think originally um, the, the constitution was written after Iraq was liberated in 2005, um, which, which allowed uh, Kurdistan uh, region to uh, develop its own oil and gas law, and that allowed it to issue production sharing contracts, which it did very successfully and, in, and brought in um, a, a large number of oil and gas players to, to, to Kurdistan. Um, However, um, in terms of looking at exporting that oil to international markets, um, following ISIS's involvement in, um, uh, in Iraq, in the broader area of Iraq, um, Kurdistan started exporting through the, through the Chehan pipeline, Turkey to Iraq to Chehan pipeline. And um, at the time, uh, Baghdad disagreed with the, uh, with the interpretation of the constitution and put in place uh, an arbitration um, which in Paris, which finally ruled uh, last, year, last year and which, awarded, which made an award to, um, to, to Iraq. Uh, so Turkey's shut the, uh, shut the pipeline in, which has um, resulted in ongoing negotiations to, um, um, to resolve that on pass between Turkey and Iraq. Um, <clears throat> And what we've seen is, is that whilst it's shut in, I believe that but all both Turkey and Iraq and Kurdistan, everybody is losing out because 400,000 barrels a day, which would be accessing international markets are not. And that's losing revenue to to all of the people of to people of Iraq. So um, I actually think that that will be um, that will come to come to a head or come to a result soon. There are some other political issues, uh, of course, which surround it. Um, because this, this, you've got a long dated history between Turkey, Iraq and Kurdistan, and those actually need to play out um, before we see a resolution. But I think yours, I, I've been encouraged certainly by the, um, the heads of, well, the foreign ministers and the energy ministers um, get, being in each other's capitals. So Ankara, Erbil and uh, Baghdad, as, as, for, as recently as last week, and some very positive statements were coming out of that. Um, I believe it may. Um, so we'll see, uh, see see where that goes. And there's also reported or rumoured uh, a meeting from the of the new or oh, well, the president uh, Erdogan from Turkey going to be in Baghdad uh, fairly shortly to hopefully re resolve the, any outstanding issues. So sorry, sorry, quite a long-winded one, but it's quite complex uh, uh, from uh, politically. Um, we now have a, another question we can see. Whilst uncertain, given current local market conditions, do you expect to become cash flow positive in the coming months, regardless of the state of the pipeline? Um, I think what we can say in terms of our on outgoing costs, our outgoing costs we've stated in this presentation, um, and it's in the RNS, is in the order of $6 million net to GKP. 
Um, and actually, uh, our current production rate um, is over the last few days has been 23,000 barrels a day. And if you multiply 23,000 barrels a day by 30 days by our net share of 36% and $30 a barrel, you get to somewhere in the order of seven and a half million dollars. So you could argue on an ongoing basis, we are already in a positive cash flow situation. Of course, we do have some accounts payable that we will need to pay in uh, over the next few months. So um, I would say that we are actually um, in a cash flow positive situation, but we are, of course, striving to increase local sales further such that we can um, um, increase that headroom and also give us some flexibility about managing accounts payable um, going forward. Thanks. Um, Ian, do you want to take the next one? Happy to do that. Uh, the, uh, the next one <clears throat> makes reference to a Reuters article that was uh, published this morning uh, with, with quite a headline, in fact. Um, and the question uh, says, Reuters have reported this morning that Golf Keystone fears for its future viability and Kurdistan crude, crude woes. Do you think this is a fair reading of today's announcement? Um, I think that really building on John's uh, comments there and the, the comments that we've just made, we've made significant progress in number one, reducing our costs. Uh, we brought down our run rate significantly by about two thirds from the beginning of the year. Uh, we are increasing uh, local sales. We have talked also today about the step up in local sales that we have been achieving from 5,000 barrels a day to the end of July up to around 23,000 barrels a day towards the end of August on average. And, and our objective is to continue to, to increase that. Um, and with that, as John just noted, cash flow positive in terms of our ongoing operating uh, costs. Um, now, I think that one thing that uh, the Reuters did pick up is in our financial statements, we have a going concern disclosure, and there is some caution signaled in that. Um, so maybe a bit of background on that to help you understand that. When we prepare a, um, an assessment of our going concern, which is in effect our ability to continue operating for the next 12 months, we look at a number of scenarios. Um, and under those scenarios, we, we of course see ourselves as um, uh, an ongoing uh, entity, been able to, to meet our obligations as they become due. And in fact, as we continue to look to, to uh, drive local sales, the, the, the cash balance is, is relatively healthy. Now, in that going concern statement, there was a reference uh, to an extreme downside. So, as I said, when we test the going concern, we test a range of outcomes and we test the extreme downside, which in effect means you know, as of today, we have zero revenues uh, going forward. And um, of course, that is not where we're at today, but we're just signaling that in the event of absolutely zero revenues, we're, we would have to look at taking further actions. And those further actions have already been signaled. Uh, we already have options to reduce our run rate by 2 million a month. We are actively pursuing inventory sales. So we're actually, as always, trying to be ahead of this, driving down our costs and looking for uh, sources of liquidity. So I, I think that while in the strictest sense, we have one line in the entire release, I think you have to look at it in the context and you have to look at it in terms of the overall judgment. And we very much see ourselves as a going concern, proactively focusing on the things that we can control. Thanks, Ian. Um, the next question is, will trucking and local sales persist in, if the pipeline is opened? I think you'll have seen via Apicure, we've, we've made it very clear that we really don't wish to start exporting crude oil again unless it's very clear uh, that we're going to get paid for both that current production and historic arrears. Um, obviously, you'll be aware of um, we're allowed, we're entitled to sell our production and the state's entitled to sell their production 
separately under the um, uh, under the production sharing agreement that we have with them. So it is quite possible that that you'd see both exports and trucking operations in, in parallel. But our, our sincere belief is that that um, Kurdistan's going to um, will give us the assurances and give us the money for ongoing ongoing production um, once we re, once we resume exports. Um, <clears throat> Mark, uh, next question. With uh, 21,300 barrels of oil per day at $30 a barrel, sales into local markets means that around 20 million revenue at 36 per share, this covers the $6 million costs a month, of, uh, our $6 million a month costs. Um, why would the company need to cut costs further? Um, I think what we said in this is this is around uh, production. Um, local sales has been fairly... Um, erratic is the best word I think I can use uh, and the price that we get paid for it is, is, has been fluctuating so um, we therefore are focused on if local sales reduces then we'd have to reduce costs as Ian's just explained if if production continues to grow then we'll we'll need to use six million dollars a month to run our full production facilities so we, we wouldn't be if that's the situation um, so that, I think that answers uh, that question if the pipeline opened now, how quickly can you get back to 55,000 barrels of oil per day? Um, so I think, um, sorry, we just, oh. well. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, ahead. sorry, sorry. sorry. Just having question, trouble with, our, with our Q&A yeah. uh, list of questions. So, so how quickly can we get back up to previous production levels? Um, we, we believe that we could get to sort of 40 to 45,000 barrels a day within four weeks. And to get back up above 50,000 barrels a day, it will take us about four to eight weeks. Um, the primary reason for this is, uh, is around um, bringing our pumped wells back on. Um, and we're trying to treat them with kid gloves, essentially. If you put too much straw down on, the, on these high, large fractures, you tend to shock fractures and we're concerned that we may pour water in. So it's we're basically we're bringing them back on, on slowly. But I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, can you please comment on the recent Apicure statement regarding Iraq offering a payment of $6 per barrel of, of oil, barrel of oil produced? What prompted the going concern language in the press release? Um, okay, so the, the first part of that is Firstly, the six dollars a barrel was is reported in the press, um, and uh, the Apicure statement effectively is saying that we're, we're quite we're unsure about where the six dollars comes from. Um, it's 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 kind of it's alluded to um, it's the average production cost of uh, some oil fields in Iraq, but the oil fields aren't actually stated, and the um, and the six dollars operating cost, we don't know what the basis of that. So it seems what some some somewhat arbitrary in in its uh, in in its creation. And clearly, it is uh, far short of anything that we could find possibly acceptable. But bearing in mind that this is this is a payment of this is a this is a mechanism to calculate a budget transfer payment between Iraq and the uh, and the Kurdistan regional government. Um, we're also conscious that the Kurdistan regional government is paid somewhere or is planned to be paid around 12.67% of the entire Iraqi budget, less sovereign expenses. So um, in our in our calculations, if, if they were paid $6 for, for all the oil that was produced or exported, plus the 12.67% that's purported that they will get under the budget law, they have more than sufficient costs to cover their, um, their ongoing um, payments and uh, uh, the payments that we required under our production sharing agreement. Uh, the second part, I think, was covered um, by, by Ian previously in the previous question uh, yeah. regarding going concern language. Um, do GKP receive all the current uh, local crude sales at $30 per barrel um, directly before any distribution goes to other parties, such as KRG's percentage owed? Um, if so, can GKP offset the KRG monies owed from local sales against the $151 million, thus reducing the amount of monies owed to help uh, cash flow going forward? Happy to take that, uh, John. Um, now, currently, um, as we've noted, uh, all, all crude sales, um, there's buyer prepayments. That is a, a key stipulation. Um, so that is for the... Uh, 
for for a large proportion of the sales. Uh, currently, there is an element that the the state is taking in kind, which is fine. They they manage a proportion of it, but at, at the current moment, as we noted, we have received um, eight million dollars, which includes buyer prepayments and amounts due to to Mole and the KRG. Um, we, as a as a matter of routine, we pay our partner on a monthly basis. Uh, you, you make a very good point regarding uh, the $151 million that the KRG owes us and the fact that we're also holding monies that, that we owe them. Um, that would be a, a discussion in, uh, in due course. Um, at this point in time, we have the monies and it's bolstering our short-term liquidity. Very good, Ian. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I think the next question is, when was the last point of contact with the KRG in relation to the sanctity of production showing contracts and the pending oil and gas law? So the last the last meeting uh, we had, as you say, on the 23rd of, uh, of August, the Kurdistan regional government said that they'd held meetings with us. And that was, in fact, true. We met with um, uh, Umed Sabir, who's the president of the cabinet, we, uh, Rahim. Uh, sorry, Aman Rahim was there, the uh, Justice Minister was there, um, the Acting Minister of Natural Resources, uh, Dr. Kamal uh, Atoshi, uh, plus also some other uh, members of the Ministry of Natural Resources were also present. Um, and we kind of, we have dialogue, dialogue ongoing with the, most of those people, um, in fact, on a continual basis, and we have very good access to uh, to those individuals that we can we can talk talk about. In that meeting, um, it was stated uh, again that um, our contracts have sanctity, and that they see very much see uh, our contracts as a partnership um, uh, for the good of Kurdistan and Iraq and uh, and and the international oil companies. Um, on the 28th, you say Epicure released a statement which which talked about us not producing oil into the pipeline unless it's clear how we get paid for that. Um, so we've, we've, we've represented that to uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, and to Umed Sabir uh, when we were having these conversations about we really need to understand how we're going to get paid and when we're going to get paid for, well, we're, we're expected to be paid for ongoing production um, under the terms of the contract. And for our arrears, we really want to understand when we're going to get paid for those arrears. What is the maximum you can produce um, without the pipeline um, being open? We have a physical limit, we believe, uh, on, our, on our trucking. We have, we have uh, two trucking stations, one at each of the production facilities. And we believe it's in the order of kind of 40,000 to 44,000 barrels of oil a day if, if we're just trucking. And the difference in those numbers is really around 44,000 around so perfect operations. But there's always some downtime um, with trucking operations because you've got truck, you've got a lot of trucks coming and going, as you can imagine. So that we've kind of that's about 90 percent of, of the, our theoretical maximum. So 40 to 44 is is around the number. I think that um, concludes the questions, actually. So, John, uh, so back to you, uh, mediator, uh, mediator. John, Ian, thank you very much indeed, absolutely. And thank you for addressing all of those questions uh, that came in from investors. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, uh, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended, just for you to review um, to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. Um, but John, perhaps before just really looking to redirect those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with, that'd be great. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I say if you, people do have questions, obviously they can access our website and pose questions to 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 Aaron Clark, our head of um, uh, international uh, head of IR and communications. So please feel free to direct questions to him. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody uh, on the call, um, current investors. Uh, I very much appreciate your continued support. Uh, people listening in to think about investing, well, hopefully um, you'll be uh, enamored with our story and our potential um, and potentially think about in investing. Um, and really, thank you for your time today and hope it's been informative. Thank you very much. John, that's great. And Ian as well, thank you once again for updating investors today. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This won't take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. Please.
On behalf of the management team of Gulf Keystone Petroleum Limited, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session, so good afternoon to you all.